Hey, good people, Batavia here. So let's chat about what went well and then what failed in the garden. I have 10 things and then I'm gonna have a bonus at the end. Let's dig in. We're gonna cover off on both the backyard and front yard and we're gonna focus on everything from vegetables that went well or failed as well as planting styles, designs and such. So what went really well, tomatoes. Tomatoes in general went really well for me this year, which is so great because last year was a struggle year for tomatoes, but more specifically where I planted tomatoes this year. So I ventured away from growing them in the beloved cage baby that's on the other side of the garden, and I'm using this space instead. So this garden space in particular has done well for me over the years. I've never grown tomatoes here, um, but it has produced year over year. But I was concerned about kind of these fruiting crops, specifically tomatoes, and whether or not laying on top of this patio, would it be enough for them? Would the soil be rich enough to feed them throughout the season? Uh, so what I ended up doing at the beginning of the season, I basically started off with the soil that was already in the bed. So since the bed sit about 10 inches high, I had about eight to nine inches of soil. I amended the bed with compost. And then when I planted each of the tomato plants, there are five total, I ended up adding some granular all-purpose fertilizer. And then about six or so weeks after I planted and the tomatoes were growing, I came back in and top dressed each of the beds with the granular fertilizer, focusing closer to each individual plant. I also have a couple of pepper plants here that are doing pretty well. I've only seen one vegetable come out with what looks like blossom end rot, but otherwise everything is doing really well. We've made it to basically the end of the summer growing season and the production has been great. Uh, so that is a win in my book. And just as a preview, my intention would be to move the structure to basically this set of beds next year in an attempt to continue to rotate my tomato crops. That's the plan. We'll see if that happens. Next up is cover. I use basically two types of cover. We'll talk about this netting in just a few. The other type of cover that I use, and I use this religiously, it's some material that's going to protect my greens from the notorious cabbage moth, one of the number one pests in my garden. So this year I used row cover and it has done a phenomenal job. The only note that I have is depending on the pressure against the cover, you may find that it increases the odds that you'll get holes in it and that really is going to defeat the purpose. The row cover is really for frost protection more than anything, uh, but it has been effective in my space and I've not had any trouble with growing vegetables like collards and cabbage underneath that cover during the summer. The other type of material that I use is tulle fabric and I've used this for a bunch of years. Uh, my only complaint is that it is very, very delicate and I could barely get out of a season without it having tears. Um, the current state of it is it's taped up in every place. And again, just to avoid the cabbage moth getting inside of the cover onto the greens laying eggs, which lead to the cabbage worm, which can decimate plants. I have kale, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, cabbage, under this type of cover and it has continually done well. Absolutely a success in the garden this season as well. This is the garden netting that I like to use. It doesn't stop any type of insects. As a matter of fact, bees still get in and get out without issue, so that's a good thing. Um, but it definitely deters kind of crawling animals. So I have a lot of stray cats in my area. Squirrels are notorious, um, especially once we get to the later part of the season as they're trying to store things for over winter. Um, and then I've also had some bouts with raccoons. There are possums that crawl around, um, but generally speaking, I've not seen anything this season get into the garden beds, digging or damaging any plants. Use PVC pipe, 10, foot PVC pipe and I cut it down. I wanted these hoops to be high. I actually spray painted it black just for aesthetic reasons. I used that to create the structure for 
the netting and then I use spring clamps. I have a few different sizes, but that can basically secure it to the bed. And this works the same way if you have wooden beds or containers. Um, it, you may just need to adjust the size of the spring clamp. Okay, doke. so next up is taking advantage of smaller spaces in my garden. So because my garden is kind of chopped up into a large bed here, a smaller space here, a container there, it sometimes is difficult to plan out what's going to grow where. And I generally, even after all of these years, have a tendency to pack things in. And so I have a few spaces that are smaller than what many would consider kind of your normal raised bed. But this year I really feel like I took advantage of the spaces and they really, really performed well. So behind me is a single raised bed because vegetables are pouring out of it. I'm gonna show you its twin bed so you can get an idea of the size. This raised bed where I still have food growing is not the same size height. Um, this is actually two raised beds that I stacked. It's a fire pit that I picked up from one of the home improvement stores and it's 36 inches around and then it goes 13 inches tall. So right now I have a bed that's about 26 inches tall but you don't need that. I did that specifically because of the way I was growing potatoes this year. So next year, my plan will be to move this top raised bed over to this space. And so over here, we're growing three specific vegetables. And I'm super pleased because I resisted the urge of packing in a bunch of things here, and it really worked well this year. So in this space, I have a single kale plant, which also shows you kind of what a plant can do. And then I have individual celery plants. There are about five or six of them here. And then the largest is a single eggplant. Next up, containers. One of my favorite ways to expand your garden footprint. It can be a little bit tricky. Every year isn't, you know, a great success. So this year happened to be one. I had a couple of things, namely my squash plants that suffered a bit, but overall, most everything else grew really well. I have potatoes here that stay tuned for that. Still super excited about it. Um, I gave okra a try. It did okay. Um, and then I had probably the first true year of success with growing tomato plants in containers. And I think that again is more about the gardener and how much you're nurturing those containers. These were all grow bags ranging from 10 to 20 gallons along this line and overall super duper pleased. I also transitioned into growing collard green plants this year as a part of my container gardening. And so my note here is they did fabulous during the spring. As the seasons moved on, I had struggles keeping those containers watered. A part of it probably was where they were situated as well, maybe a little bit out of sight, out of mind. So my focus there is gonna be for specifically collard green plants. I'll focus on growing them in containers in the spring or fall, but not the summer. Peppers, I just can't say enough about when it comes to how well they do. Generally speaking, containers are always gonna have a place in my garden and this year was a real success. One of the key components of our gardens, I really stayed on top of watering the garden this year. Um, I had a couple of trips where on one of those trips, it was the hottest kind of days in the month and I ended up using a overhead sprinkler for those days. But other than that, I continued to water by hand. While that's not a long-term goal, it's the way I've been gardening and the way I've been watering my garden. And I felt like all of my plants did well with the amount of water I was adding with the combination of the rain and it's really a win because that can be a real struggle in our garden so I want to make sure that I acknowledge that and generally speaking start the season off maybe watering every seven to ten days in the spring maybe a little bit longer in between watering and then in the summer probably once every four-ish days so not quite uh, once a week, maybe sometimes twice a week, just depending on how much it had rained and how much I actually had um, growing at the particular time. All of those things kind of fold into how much I was watering. Okie doke, so now we focus on what failed. 
fail does feel like it's a bit dramatic. And while things didn't completely fail, there are absolutely some things, and I have five of them to share, at least five, that uh, struggled that really could have done better. And so the first step is going to be bees. The first step is going to be starting seeds indoors. It really breaks up the monotony of winter for me, you know, heading into spring and I enjoy it, but I really had a struggle with trying to get things really started and nurturing them indoors before I got a chance to transplant them out. So what does that look like? It looks like in January, me starting lettuce seeds far too early. <laughs> and then in February and March, when I really want to be able to start my, you know, other brassicas, I want to be able to start things like celery. I want to be able to start things like even peppers and tomatoes as kind of spring comes in. I just didn't get that done as early as I really needed to. So the end result looks like things coming out to the garden much smaller than I really wanted them to. Um, it looks like me just foregoing planting some things, especially along the herb line. Um, it ended up being starting some things that didn't do well and so I ended up buying transplants and these are vegetables that I don't traditionally buy transplants for. That one I'm going to put into the fail column because I absolutely had control over it and I stumbled all throughout the way and I even continued to stumble as I wanted to get things started indoors for fall. Didn't happen. <laughs> so, uh, so again, as I go into next year, ultimately I know what needs to happen. And I am confident based on some of the disappointments that I had this year that we'll get those things done. Next up is one that's directly related, no pun intended, but it's direct sowing my summer crops. So not all, but some of my summer crops like my squash, cucumbers, um, I tried to direct sow okra, and I've had success with those over the years. This year was a real struggle. You know, believe it or not, roly polies were savage this year. So, so many of my seedlings, melons are a great example, so many of my seedlings just were eaten up. And as you're managing all of these things kind of in the very last bit of spring going into summer, there's a lot going on. So it was hard for me to keep track of what was struggling what wasn't what I needed to resow and ultimately the plan there is going to be to start more I'm gonna pile on I'm gonna start more indoors to transplant out I've had success with that in the past I'm gonna to return to that I prefer generally to direct sow as much as I can because it's just easier on me as the gardener but my season and the time I have to get some of these things planted and growing, I just don't want to continue to take those chances that some of these crops that I'm direct sowing will actually take off. Now, it doesn't mean I can't do both, but I definitely want to have some things in the background to put in place if some of these things I direct sow don't work out. All right, next up, and let's move around a bit. I want to talk about and show some things that just didn't get the job done in the way that I know that they could. This is really about setting expectations, being reasonable. So this space, and I'm really focused on these two new growing spaces. This is year two for growing, and they're definitely vegetables that are growing, some vegetables that are struggling. <laughs> Dead tomato plant here, a tomato plant that is producing, but not to the level of some of the other tomato plants in the garden of the same variety those aromas there. And then there's some things that are just producing super duper slow. Now, I have my prize winning cabbage over here, of course. But again, what I wanted this growing space to do is really vining crops to grow up this trellis and fill it out. And more specifically, make it easier for me to harvest some of these vegetables. This is year two of a basically empty trellis. And while the aesthetic, you know, I miss the idea of the leaves and the canopy it creates. It's the food, really, <laughs> that I've not grown kind of vertically like I've wanted to. So all in all, you know, it's not a complete fail. I know this space will become more productive. It's just a bit more work I have to put into it. And I'm gonna point directly to soil health here and also the amount of shading that occurs, which I didn't account for, with even just these raised beds creating a bit of shade over the course of, you know, the initial growing. So 
Yeah, <laughs> a bit more on trellising. It actually deserves its own spot on this list. So we spoke about kind of some of the struggles with the previous fail, but that's another look at how the trellis looks as of the end of the season. But I also have some vertical growing that I've done year over year in this space. And this is as, as my mom would say, like it's a poor looking trellis, right? It has done so much better over the years. This year, it's a bit of a flop. Um, so I had pole beans, scarlet runner here, and then cucumbers. And I, I'm starting to get the beginning of powdery mildew here, which is, you know, at this point it's fine. It's at the end of the season. Um, and then I have sweet potatoes underneath. And I don't know. I don't know if this is just too much for this space. I don't know. I honestly don't even remember if I amended this space coming into the season. So I'm going to make sure I take some of my normal steps going into next year in hopes of better performance out of this space. And again, I'm a big fan of vertical gardening, but I wanna take advantage of it, you know, and this is not that. <laughs> so that is our next one, trellising. I have one more review of where trellising worked, but it wasn't as convenient as I would have wanted it to be. Okay, Doug, so last trellis space, the setup, the design really, really worked. The place I put it was the struggle. And it's really because it's hard for me to get in between this space, which led to me harvesting fewer beans than I really wanted to because it wasn't convenient to climb in between. And to be quite frank, there were moments where I was a little bit afraid just because of some of the animals, specifically the raccoons, like what's hiding on the other side of that garage. So I'm going to use this again next year, but not in this particular space. So fail, eh, well, maybe not a fail, but if I would have thought this through a bit further, I could have had much more production out of this space. Okay, Doug, so last up on the fail list, and before we get to the bonus, it's transitioning from season to season or even transitioning growing spaces once whatever I've grown is finished up. So more years than not, I've planted my garden in the summer and that's it. You know, basically once the cold weather comes, I'm done growing. So there isn't that kind of what's next in mind. The last five or six years, that's been a real focus of mine. I wanna take advantage of spring, summer and fall but it's been, there's been growing pains. So the best visual of this is the beds behind me. So these two beds have a volunteer mustard plant and then volunteer snapdragons. But they've ultimately been empty since mid-July and mid-August. And that's not a part of my plan. I just really have had a hard time in the midst of everything that's, else that's growing to get these things done, right? You know, so I say I'm giving myself some grace while it is on the fail list, meaning of course I could have done better here. It's not the end of the world if they're empty. As I record this video in my mind, I still have time to get some things planted, um, but it's okay if I don't. Um, this is, this part of gardening when it comes to multi-seasons is still fairly new. You know, five years in my mind isn't that long and so, I'm gonna be okay with this. I know a part of some of the fails are all tied to planning and executing, which is kind of odd because it's what a part of what I do professionally. Um, and I've generally wanted the garden to be a bit more casual, like not as rigid. I don't wanna have to say, all right, on this day, this must be done, and this day, this must be done. And while I won't go to that extreme, I absolutely need to put some effort into better planning, better design and then actually executing. I know it's gonna make me happier as a gardener. It's gonna make my garden happier and more productive. So that's what I'm going to commit to going into next year's growing season. All right, so before we wrap up, we have a bonus. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of clips and I'm gonna give you one word and it is potatoes. Finally, <laughs> I feel like we've gotten to the place that I really wanted to be when it comes to potatoes. And 
I'll be frank, a lot of it has been resetting my expectations about what I'm putting in, meaning how much I'm planting, and then tippering that with how much I expect to get out of those planting spaces. So this year I really couldn't be happier. And again, leave it on a high note, this is absolutely a win in my book, absolutely a success. So that is what I have. I appreciate y'all spending some time with me. If you have any questions or comments about anything I've shared, this video or otherwise, feel free to drop it below. If you have things that were really successful in your garden that you want to share, things that didn't do so well that you want to share, feel free to drop it below as well. And I look forward to seeing you all in the next one.